All right, let's pray. Father, we sure do thank you for your many blessings. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being gathered here today. We'd ask now, Lord, as we teach the Bible, that you might give us wisdom to be able to do the things you would have us to do. Thank you, Lord, for the folks that are already gathered here early this morning. I pray, God, you'll bless them as well as those that are on the way and those that have traveled from such a great distance. We thank you for giving them traveling mercies. Uh, Lord, so often we take that for granted that you're just going to get them here and <clears throat> appreciate you clearing all the things out of the way for them to get here and pray now that you'll bless us with your presence. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. Glad you're here this morning and glad for the most part you're well. We got some people back among us that have been real sick and some people are still out. And uh, somebody asked me the other day, they said they got the, the, uh, the flu and they were thinking about coming. And I said, well, uh, if you're going to come, I'd suggest two things. One, if you want to come, okay, but I'd stay in the back and stay away from everybody because from what I understand about it, it's pretty contagious. And I said, uh, you know, you're, you're pretty young, but when old folks get something like that, it can, uh, it can really put a hurting on us. And uh, so uh, they decided to, you know, to stay home and tune in. And I completely understand that. Uh, in the old days, I think I mentioned this on Wednesday, when somebody got the measles, you know, the parents will load you up and expose everybody to the measles. Well, nowadays with this stuff going around, you, you don't even know what it is you're dealing with. And uh, so when you're sick, then do your best to get well and then get back among us. Uh, all right, Revelation chapter number 8. Now we left off in chapter 7, the last verse there. Uh, in verse number 17, the Bible says, For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them into living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes. And uh, you can get that thing from Wednesday night if you'd like to, but there's two times it's mentioned. Both times it's after judgment. One is after the judgment seat of Christ. People say, well, when I get to heaven, there'll be no more tears. We sing those songs all the time, but there's still going to be tears in heaven. Two different times. One, the judgment seat of Christ, when the Lord shows you what you could have had. In other words, He'll show you the potential that you had, that He gave you, and what you could have had had you used it to your fullest potential to, fullest potential to your fullest ability. And then the other time will be at the great white throne judgment, and this will be after you have the mind of Christ. Once you get the mind of Christ, come to uh, Matthew chapter 23, I'll show you something. Once you get the mind of Christ, it doesn't make you cold and hard and uncaring and unconcerned. Matthew chapter 23. Uh, you'll see people come up there that, believe it or not, you'll know. And uh, the, the sad thing about that is, is that when they come up there, Matthew chapter 23... When they come up there, they'll come up either, one, they'll have come up after the millennial kingdom, or two, they will come up from hell. The ones that you know will have come up from hell. That means they get a break from hell, which is a literal burning furnace down in, down in the center of the earth right now. And it's burning right now. And uh, like the old preacher said, he said, you know, uh, his, his mother died and his daughter asked him, said, well, uh, Daddy, you believe uh, your, your mother is in hell? He said, yes, if she didn't trust Jesus Christ as her Savior, I believe she's in hell. Uh, Daddy, is she burning right now? And he said, yes, if she's in hell, she's burning right now. Daddy, is she screaming right now? And he said, yes, she'd be screaming right now. She's in everlasting torment. And he said, I don't look forward to the day. He got kind of broke up about it. The, the day that I see my mother come up at the great white throne judgment, and I look at my mother in spite of all that she did wrong, and my mother stands there in front of the Lord, and when he gets done, he says, Depart from me, you cursed, and everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels, and says, Get out. And she bows her head and bends her knees and confesses Jesus Christ to the glory of God the Father, and then off into eternity she goes and loses her bodily shape there and goes down and burns in the lake of fire forever. Now, uh, you'd be an awful, uncaring, very cold-hearted individual if that didn't touch your heart and make you weep over that. Yeah. You say, well, preacher, how can I prevent that? Well, do the best you can to tell them. Yeah. Do the best you can to minister to them. Do the best you can to witness to them. And there's a lot of ways to do that. I gave you the passages in Jude, and the reason I'm going over this is, is it's not, I, have you ever noticed this? God's not in a hurry. Right. It would help you all if you would learn God's not in a hurry, and that way you'd learn to slow down a little bit. Yeah. It's not, I've got to get them in, I've got to get them in, I've got to do it right now, I've got to do it right now, the door's shut, and I've got to get them. And sometimes what you do is you put pressure on somebody to respond to your pressure instead of learning to respond to the Holy Spirit. So all you, your job is, is to tell them. And after that, it's the Lord's deal to close the deal. You're not here to close the deal. You're not here to get them signed on the dotted line. You're not here to hurry and to get them to church or to whatever. You're there to present it and let the Holy Spirit lead them. 
Uh, but the thing that will happen is, is when you get there in, in, uh, at the great white throne judgment, that will be after you've already gone to the judgment seat of Christ. It will be after you've had the marriage supper of the Lamb. It will be after the, the millennial kingdom where you'll be ruling and reigning with the Lord. It will be after the judgment of nations. It will be after the battle of Armageddon. It will be after the, the battle of Gog and Magog. And now they're standing up there in front of the Lord. And all of a sudden these people start coming out one at a time. And for people that you don't know, it probably won't mean anything to you. Not much. But here the Lord does this in Matthew, and this is the, the, uh, the, the thing I want to show you so that you'll understand that if, if the Lord weeps over it, and if you have the mind of Christ, I imagine it will make you weep too, that somebody would have to spend eternity like that. You know what's going to happen, ladies and gentlemen? You get to the great white throne judgment, in spite of the fact that you have a mind like Christ, you know what's going to happen? You're going to be up there and you're going to see people that lived a better life than you lived without Christ. And you get the break and get to go to heaven and they wind up going to an eternal lake of fire and burning forever because they rejected Him. Now they're going on their own. I get all that. I understand it. But you don't ever want to be so cold and so hard-hearted and so calloused that you rejoice over somebody going to hell. And you rejoice over somebody going to the lake of fire. Jesus Christ didn't rejoice over people going there. He is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. The reason He came to die was to give them an opportunity to get out. He doesn't say, oh goody, I'm glad they get to go. Yeah, there's passages in the Bible about judgment coming on them and that kind of a thing when they, when they do that, but that's for him to do. That's certainly not for me and you. Uh, the great white throne judgment won't be one of those times where you get up there and get to say, nah, 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 I told you so. I was right and you were wrong and now you're going to burn forever. You don't want to get up there with that kind of an attitude. And sometimes, I, I hate to say this, but sometimes our witnessing in the day and age in which we are now comes across with that edge to it. It comes across with this, I'm right and you're wrong. Uh, there's some people, there's a lot of tapes that go out and a lot of stuff goes out from a lot of, they've got this air about them that says, I'm right, you're wrong, and you know, so what, you can just go to hell for all I care. That's not the spirit of Jesus Christ at all, and that's not holy boldness as has been taught. That's stupidity, that's arrogance, that's obnoxiousness. You say, what the Lord did? Sat down with them, ate with them, talked with them, spent time with them, tried to give them the opportunity to follow, not forced them at gunpoint to, to go. Uh, a lot of times our ministering, our witnessing, I'll, I'll get to this in Revelation in just a second, our ministering, our witnessing comes across more like Hitler than it does come across like Jesus Christ. Amen. Follow me or I'll kill you. And a lot of times what happens is they see us and you know what they say? They look at us and they say, well, if that's what being a Christian is all about, I don't really want anything to do with it. We get real judgmental. We forget the pit we came from. We forget where we would be if it wasn't for Christ intervening in our life. And, and when that happens, you have an, you have an edge about it. And we, we liken it unto boldness. It's not boldness at all. It's almost as if to say you're something special because you, you talk like a Calvinist. I'm something special because I, I got out, but you're, you're going to hell. Too bad for you. Well, that wouldn't be the Lord's attitude at all. I'd hate to get to the great white throne judgment, and I'm sure there's going to be there some that I'll weep over that I should have told I didn't tell. There's probably some I've forgotten about by now. Uh, but I've, I've actually tried to pray about it because it, it, it bothers me now. It didn't bother me as much years ago. It bothers me now. I get to thinking about how many did you, what, what messes you made along the way just because of stupidity and pride and arrogance and that kind of thing, and how many of them... Okay, they rejected it on their own, but how many of them did I help by my attitude to make it easy to reject? You see what I'm saying? I don't want to be a stumbling block and help somebody into hell. I want to try to help them as much as I can without compromise. I, I get that, but a lot of times what we say is compromise is just nothing but raw pride and conceit. Verse 37, we won't back down for nothing. 37, 23, 37, here's the Lord. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is desolate, and left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. You know what the Lord says? He's standing up there and he's 
looking at Jerusalem and he's saying, man, I would have gathered you. I wanted to gather you. I wanted the opportunity to gather you, but you wouldn't give me that opportunity. And now, you know what? Bless you. Now you're done for. He's not rejoicing over that. He's not happy over that. And so you shouldn't be happy that you happen to get it. Come back to Revelation chapter 8. Have you ever stopped to think about this? Have you, ever, have you ever stopped to think that it was the Lord that intervened in your life and it's the Lord, it's because of the Lord you're sitting here? You don't, your, your flesh don't want to come here. There's no way. You give your flesh too much credit. Your flesh is like a, it's like a prison cell. If you, if you get it, I'm preaching on this a little bit today, but your flesh is like a prison cell, if Romans 8 is true. Uh, the, the one on the inside wants out. And what the Lord did when he saved you was is he came down there and he cut your chains off and he cut you, set you free from your prison cell, but you're still in there. He has to feed you kind of through the window. So I'll, I'll get you out of there sooner or later. But he comes down there and what he does is he, he brings you the stuff. You need meets all your needs and takes care of all the things that you need and he handles that stuff. And then one day he's going to take you out of there. There's nothing in your flesh that desires anything to do with God. If you're here today, it's not because of this thing on the outside. And you can't take credit for being here. It's God that gave you the desire to be here in the first place. I know that kind of messes with your mind a little bit, but you're, you don't desire God in the flesh. Now, if I walk in the Spirit, it's like, okay, I'm going to follow the Spirit. Well, why am I going? Because the Holy Spirit said I should get up and go. So you can't even glory in that. It's like, well, you know, people talk all the time about church attendance. You don't get any credit for that. You're not here because you did it. <laughs> the Lord had you to do it or you wouldn't have got here. You ever think about it reading the Bible? Well, I read the Bible every day. Why do you read it? So you get a medal or a chest to pin it on, or you get to mark a ditty mark, or why, why do you read it? What it gave you the desire to read it? <laughs> the new man wants something to eat. Well, I made it, well, I guarantee you the old man didn't want it. You know what the old man will do? The old man will go thumbing through the Bible to look for an excuse to justify his sin. He'll find a verse to justify whatever he wants to do. But the new man's not like that. The new man goes through there and he says, I need to point out some things that aren't right. And we need to get them right so we can stay in fellowship with the one on the inside here. And when you go to that, you go with the Bible the whole different way of looking at things. You're not looking at why, God, you do that. Why did you do that? I can't believe you did Why are you? I'm looking for why, God. And God's like, oh, you're going to be looking for a long time. I'm not going to tell you why. I'm just going to say, I am. Why are you doing that? Because I am. Are you God that he should answer to you? If he answers to you, bless you, if he answers you, who's the God then? You ever think about some of the stuff we ask him? Revelation chapter number 8, verse number 1. That's all free, no, no, no extra charge there. Verse number 1. Uh, that, that's uh, self-reflections uh, of, of my own personal life. The Bible says this in verse number 1, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of a half an hour. Now, there's a lot of conjecture about this stuff. A lot of people talk about, you know, what the silence in heaven is. One fellow says, well, I know why there's silence in heaven, because there's no women in heaven, and that's why there's silence in heaven, and that's funny, but it's not true. Uh, uh, there may not be women in heaven, but that's not why it's silent up there. That makes a, a, you know, a good joke, but that's not, the, that's not the truth of the matter. I'm sorry y'all are cold. We thought it might be a little, uh, a little warmer in here this morning. Anyway, uh, then the other thing is, is that notice that, first of all, the seventh seal gets opened up. Now, it doesn't say that the seventh seal gets opened up and that starts the second trip through. It says that the seventh seal is open, which means you're at the end of the tribulation, and now you're fixing to start your second trip through, okay, to show you that at the same time the other things are going on, the seals are going on, he's fixing to show you the things that are going on with the trumpets that go on at the same time. So why is there silence? Because you're at the end of the tribulation. Now here's the best I can do with this. The best I can do with this, as long as Jesus Christ is present, there's something to shout about. So while the Lord's up there, they're over there in the passage. Remember what he says in uh, chapter number 7. He says, A great multitude which no man could number, and all the nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne before the Lamb, and clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation unto our God, and so on and so forth, and worship God, saying, Amen. Verse number 12, the end of verse 12, saying, Amen. Who are these? These are they that came out of, out of, the, out of tribulation. So there's a worship service going on up there. Now, the best I can do with this is, is that when the Lord leaves, there's nothing to shout about. 
So he must leave to go down to get the tribulation saints at the end of the tribulation because there is a rapture that takes place. This is the third one that takes place at the end of the tribulation. When we get over to it in Revelation chapter 11, this will be Moses and Elijah, and this will be the 144,000 male virgin Jews and their converts, the ones that are crying out from under the altar. That altar that's there, that one is on the earth, but then there's another one in heaven which we'll get to a little bit later on today or tonight one. So here's what you need to understand. They're all up there shouting and praising the Lord and so on and so forth. And the Lord gets up from off of his throne and he says, I'll be back in a little while. And he leaves heaven. And at that moment, everybody's like, well, ain't nothing to shout about if the Lord's yeah. gone. <laughs> you should get that. That makes good, that makes good uh, uh, understanding of a worship service. What's the point of shouting if God ain't in it? Right. What's, what, what are you shouting about? To show out? What are you shouting about? People shout at a ball game, they shout at this and they shout at that and all that other kind of stuff. Well, that's all fine in the flesh, but in a worship service, Ichabod is uh, in, in the Old Testament. You remember when the Bible says that uh, Eli fell off and because he was fat he broke his neck and his two sons were uh, given to all kind of things that they shouldn't be doing and entertaining prostitutes and this and that and the other. And uh, then the, the ark gets taken off and the woman gives birth to the child. You know what she names the child? Ichabod. The glory of the Lord hath departed. And then it gets silent in Israel. Why? Well, there's no point in shouting if God's not around. No point. There's no because why? Because any worship done without God, the center of it, is not. It, it, it's not. It doesn't count. It's idol worship. It doesn't matter even if it looks like it's a worship service. You got a lot of that going on nowadays. And so what happens here is, is that it looks like the Lord leaves. He goes down to pick up the tribulation saints. He comes up and delivers them like Lot puts them in a mountain like Lot and his two daughters. And then we get on our horses and we come down and now you've got the Battle of Armageddon and you've got the Millennial Reign and so on and so forth. So it looks like he takes them up there and puts them there for safekeeping while we come down for the Battle of Armageddon and then we start in, after the Judgment of Nations, we start in for the Millennial Kingdom. Now that's the best I can do with that. That's the only reason I can figure there'd be silence up in heaven is because the Lord left and there ain't nothing to shout about when the Lord's gone. Um, so, you know, you say, well, I don't know. Well, here's the great thing. You get up there one day, you know, you got to think about this for a second. You get up there one day, and we come to this point, and we're all standing up there, and we're praising the Lord, and we're shouting it out, having us a time, man. I mean, the judgment seat of Christ is over with, the marriage supper of the Lamb, man. We're just having us a fit up there, just having a blast, flinging our clowns at the feet of the Lord and, and having us a time. And then all of a sudden, he gets up and says, uh, I'll be back in a little while. And we're going to all look at each other and go, I guess, that's, I guess that's what it was. You, you won't know till you get there if that's what I'm telling you is right. But I think that's what it happens. I think the Lord goes down to get them the same way he comes down to get us. And when he goes to meet them, uh, he brings them up there and then delivers them and then takes them on out of there. And that's why it gets quiet. So when it gets quiet in heaven, we'll look around. And you know what you'll say? You say, well, this sure is a nice place. Yeah, I got a glorified body. Yeah, this is really nice, but there ain't nothing to shout about if he ain't here. No matter how good it is and no matter how much sin's done away with and no matter me living forever, it just kind of loses its luster when he's not around. You know what happens to you down here? What happens to you down here is if you get your eyes off of Jesus and all of a sudden you know what will happen? Life's just kind of a drag. There ain't much to shout about. You try to replace it with a false shout. You know, you try to replace it with, a, with, with something to kind of make up the whole, but it just ain't the same. And that fellowship's not what it ought to be. It's just kind of, you just kind of, well, yeah, that's, that's good. You know, well, how's everything? Fine. Yeah, it's fine. Bill's paid. Yeah, yeah I'm fine. Yeah, my wife and I get along. Yeah, it's fine. Kids are doing, yeah, well, yeah, we're good. We're all, yeah, we're all good. Yeah. Well, what's the matter, man? Been a while since I met with the Lord. Been a while since I felt him tugging my heart been a while since, you know, we've had that fellowship. I mean, I've been going through the motions. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm still going to church, reading Bible, praying, and all that kind of stuff. But just, I've, I've read every book and listened to every tape, and I'm scanning the net and looking for all the sermons and all that. But it just, it just not, uh, well, brother, what's the matter? Sister, what's the matter? Well, just the, the Lord, you know, is just not there. Amen. So just kind of don't feel much like shouting. You'd be surprised when the Lord shows up, no matter how bad your troubles are and problems are and difficulties are, you still feel like shouts just because He's there. Do you see the practical application? 
the practical application for me and you is, is that he can't be replaced with things. It don't get any better than it's going to be for me and you if you're here and saved. And I know everybody here today, I think, everybody here. And uh, it don't get any better for us that are saved when we get to heaven. And yet when the Lord leaves, what, what, what good would it be to get to the New Jerusalem and Jesus not be there? Right. It's just another place to hang out. That's the center point. That's the diamond in the king's crown. That's the, that's the focal point. That's what makes heaven heaven, is him. And when you lose that in your Christian life, that's when your life starts heading south. So what happens? It's not only that you don't shout in worship services, you quit talking about him. One of the first things, as I told an individual the other day, that goes when you lose your fellowship with the Lord, the way you know it is is you quit talking about him. Um, you, 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 stop, you stop telling other people about what he did for you. Not what he did for everybody else, what he did for you. You ever notice that about the Apostle Paul's testimony? The Apostle Paul's testimony is not, well, let me tell you, he did this, and he raised so-and-so's son, and he did so-and-so, raised so-and-so's daughter, and he healed Peter's mother-in-law, he did so-and-so, he did that. He, you know what he's always saying? Let me tell you what he did for me. Paul's constantly reminding himself of where he would be if it hadn't been for Jesus. That's, that's a good thing. That's the center point. Verse 2, I saw seven angels which stood before God, and again, we're given the seven trumpets, all right? We're getting ready to, uh, the trumpets are getting ready to prelude to, uh, to judgment here, and the judgment's going to take place, verse number uh, 3, this is someone other than the seven, and another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which were before the throne. All right, now the thing that you have to understand, uh, first of all, come over, if you will, please, to the book of Exodus. The thing that you have to understand, Exodus chapter 30, is that there is an altar that is up there in heaven. He's not talking about the altar of the temple that's down on earth, though there is one. He's talking about an altar that's up there in heaven. I remember over there in Isaiah chapter number 6, when uh, Ezekiel, I mean Isaiah is standing there and he sees the Lord and there's a seraphim that comes down there and takes a coal with the tongs from off the altar. All right, what you have to understand is, is the things that you see here on earth, they're patterned after things that are up there. That's from the book of Hebrews. The, and the Apostle Paul is told about things in Hebrews and he says these are a shadow, a type, a figure of things that are down there. So when you see the city of Jerusalem and you see the tabernacle and you see the temple, all those things point to what's up there. So when he's talking about an altar up there before the throne, he's talking about a literal altar up there that's there and he's talking about a, uh, a labor there of incense which is covered with gold, not brass. Brass is uh, for judgment. Gold is for the Lord. That's, uh, that's uh, God. has to do with God. So in Exodus chapter 30, you see where he's talking about, and he's getting ready to offer these prayers up, and prayers have to do with the saints, which we'll get to in a minute. Exodus chapter 30, verse 1, Thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon. Of shit of wood shalt thou make it. A cubit shall be the length thereof, a cubit the breadth thereof, four square shall it be, and two cubits shall it be, and the height thereof, the horns thereof shall be the same. The horns, that has to do with the power. In other words, that altar is laid out this way, and it's got horns coming up out of it. Uh, some of you guys that are real good at drawing, you could draw that, but what he's doing here is, is, is you ever wonder how, how specific he is about how it is? Exact measurements. And the reason is, is it's patterned after something that's up there. Something up there that man's never touched. What he's trying to do is, is show them a picture of what's up there in heaven. There's prayers that he's fixing to offer there. I'll show you that in just a second. This is an important thing for you and I. You say, well, preacher, you know, what about the altar? The altar is a place of sacrifice. It's a place of judgment. It's a place where you meet with God. But the prayers is past the altar. After you got all that cleared away, now you come in there and you're offering your prayers. And those prayers, the Bible says, are a sweet smell and savor unto the Lord. So he lays that thing out because when your prayers go up, they come up there through this same thing that's up there in heaven. Thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, the top thereof, verse number 3, and the sides thereof, round about, and the horns thereof, and thou shalt make unto it a crown of gold round about it. And the two golden rings shalt thou make into, uh, uh, to it under the crown of it. Uh, you guys that know how to do this stuff, you probably can imagine a blueprint of it in your mind. By the corners thereof, upon the two sides of it shalt thou make it. And they shall be for places for the staves to bear with all. You don't touch it, you pick it up with rods. It's real close in, in similarity as far as touching it to the Ark of the Covenant. 
Uh, verse number 5, And thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood and overlay them with gold, and thou shalt put it before the veil. In other words, uh, uh, the, 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 the veil, the curtain that is there before the Holy of Holies. So when you walk in, here's the brazen labor or the altar, and you shed all the blood, then the brazen labor, and that's where you look down, the mirror there is reflected. You step into the holy place, and over here on this side is the candlelight that's there, and on this side is the 12 loaves of bread, the six and the six that are there that are sprinkled with the cinnamon and the stuff that's there. And then you walk on in there, and right before that veil is the prayer, is the, is the altar of prayer. Now you want to get a hold of that. You say, why? Because it's prayer that removes the veil between you and meeting with God. That's probably the reason it's the most difficult thing to do in my life. I don't know about your life. It's not hard for me to pray in trouble, but it's hard for me to pray when the Bible says men ought always to pray and pray without ceasing. And if there's anything that I would point to quickly, just like that, and I'm not trying to be ultra-spiritual, I'm just trying to be practical with you, that I don't like in my spiritual life. I'm not talking about I've got other stuff in my flesh I deal with. I'm not saying I'm, other than this I got it down pat, so don't take that. But if there's one thing spiritually that bothers me more than anything is, it's my prayer life. It never, it never is what I want it to really be. I, 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 I try, I, I work at it, and then you, know, you find yourself, you've been praying, you think I've been praying an hour, and you get up and look at the clock, you've been going for 15 seconds. You know, it's like you step off into another world there, and then you think, I'm going to really pray about that, and I'm going to fast, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And then I find myself, when I'm doing that, I'm saying, Lord, sustain me until I get to the next meal, and sustain me until I get to the next meal. <laughs> He's thinking, you can pray about something other than food for a while. You know, you get away from, from, from eating. You get to thinking, all you're thinking about is eating. I, that's my weak spot. So sometimes we don't see God as clearly as He would like to be seen because we don't spend the time in prayer we need to spend in prayer. Giving you the practical side to it. Watch what happens. The Bible says, Thou shalt put it before the veil. That is by the ark of the testimony. So the ark of the testimony is right inside there. Before the mercy seat that is over the testimony where I will meet with thee. So prayer is where you seek God before you meet with God. In, in other words, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open... I will come in to him and open unto me and I will come with him and he with me and I'll, have, I'll sup with him, right? But you've got to be looking for him and answer the knock on the door before he's going to sit down and meet with you. So a lot of times we don't find God. You, you, you have to pray, God, I want you to speak to me this morning. Live the preacher what, what I need to have so I can get it. Or maybe while you're flipping through the Bible and I'm preaching somewhere else, the Lord points something out to you. I don't care as long as you get it. It's not always every message is for you. Some of them are takeout bags for other people. And sometimes you're sitting there and you're reading something else while I'm saying something and you're looking at something the Lord's going, look at that right there, look at that right there. And you're going, oh man, oh man. And the Lord's dealing with you about it. Okay, great, man. It don't make no difference to me as long as God speaks to you. All right, verse number 6. Put it before the veil of the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat is over to the testimony where I will meet with thee. And Aaron shall burn thereon, watch it, sweet incense every morning. When he dresses the lamps, he shall burn and increase. Now, before you stop there, notice this. He says every morning. Remember the thing I gave you a couple of Sunday nights ago about the manna? And the manna came in the morning. Now, I realize we work shift work now, and I realize people work night shifts, and I realize all, I understand all that kind of stuff. But what he's talking about is, is that there is a consistent time that you make allowance for uh, your Bible reading, your gathering manna, and your prayer life. If you just wait to say, I, I think I'll pray when I feel like it, well, if the Bible's right, you probably aren't going to feel like it until you're in trouble. Right. You have to actually make it a point to say every day, like, like this. There's times, she's not in here, but I'll say it if she wasn't here. Uh, there's times where I, I don't feel like talking to my wife. Especially like, you know, first thing in the morning or whatever, and she's been up since 5 o'clock, and I just got up, and she's like a jackrabbit, and I'm like a turtle, and I'm like, okay... I have to make an effort sometimes, or maybe there's a little tension or whatever. You have to make an effort to try to keep the relationship. You've got to talk about it. The problem you run into with is if, if, if she's one that don't like to talk and you're one that wants to talk or vice versa, then you've got to learn to get on the same page. She might have been raised to run every time somebody talks, and you might have been raised that you're going to talk about it until you get it done, and now you, you've got to learn to work that stuff out. Y'all are grinning. <laughs> Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's a real common thing. And a lot of times, it's not the man that wants to talk. Men, we have a tendency not to want to talk. She wants to talk. 
You'd rather have your face peeled off your head than to talk. <laughs> it's like, can I take a beating? Can you just like take the paddle? I really don't want to talk. You know, well, I want to, well, okay, but that's, but so you know what you have to do? You have to make an effort in order to sustain the relationship. Did you hear me? A lot of good types when it comes to a marriage. Uh, there's, there's times, and there's a time for everything. You know, a woman has to realize that sometimes it's not the time to talk and so on and so forth. But the point I'm trying to make to you is this. You have to learn to make an effort on a daily basis to talk to the Lord. You know why? Or otherwise you won't talk to Him at all until you run into a problem. And then the next thing you know, you're ringing Him up and He's like, uh, I ain't talked to you in quite some time. You ever hear the old, I guess it was sort of a, told in a sense of being a joke, but you ever hear the, the, the saying that uh, I guess the day that uh, Hurricane Katrina came through there that God heard a lot of voices he hadn't heard in a long time? Well, that could be said about us in the church. What he's saying here is, is he says it's perpetual. That means continual. That means that that incense never went out. That prayer was always going up. When he says pray without ceasing, you ever get a burden for somebody? You ever look at the book of Habakkuk and you see that guy, he starts off with in verse number 1 and he says the burden that was upon him and he was weeping and crying over the people. That meant that was a burden to him all the time. You ever get a burden like that about somebody, about a person, about something going on, not just personal stuff, but somebody that you're concerned about their relationship with the Lord? And just, you're, you're just every time you're thinking about it, you're saying, Lord, did you remember, you know, John? Remember John, Lord? I, I appreciate if you do something for John, Lord. And the fact you're sort of carrying that thing around with you on a regular basis, perpetual, continual. You say, what does that do? It keeps you in front of the Lord on a regular basis. See, prayer does a lot of things. It not only gives you requests and all that other kind of stuff and helps you to get in there when you really need to get a hold of them and that kind of a deal. But when you're talking to Him, you have a tendency not to be talking about others. And when you're talking to him, you'd be surprised. It'll keep you out of a lot of trouble. It'll keep you from talking about others, but it'll also keep you from thinking things you shouldn't be thinking and doing things you shouldn't be doing. You say, why? I don't mess up when I'm praying. You say, doesn't stuff come into your mind? Sure, it comes in your mind. Anytime I get quiet, stuff comes into my mind. You say, what do I have to do? I have to realize that, Lord, take that thing and soak it in the blood of Jesus Christ and get it out of my mind and let's move on. You know, the devil doesn't tremble when he sees me on my knees. He gets right down there beside me and says, what are you talking about? What are you praying to him for? And he ain't done nothing for you. And who do you think you are? You wicked, good for nothing. Sorry, rotten dog you. Yeah, you're right about all that stuff because you leave me alone. I'm talking to somebody. Right? Quit interrupting me. And the flesh talks to you. Well, that isn't your reason to stop. Well, preacher, you know, what do you do when that happens? Put it under the blood and keep going. It gets quiet. You're going to a holy place. So what's the devil going to do? going to give you the exact opposite. I'm going to be real plain with you. You've been exposed to enough junk because of everything you see on a regular basis that when you get into a holy place, that stuff's going to be right there with nothing stopping. It's going to be right there, just like that. Flap, flip, flip, flap, flap, flip, 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 flap, 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 flap. Somebody said, somebody did, somebody saw, somebody, whatever it might be. Soak that stuff in the blood of Jesus Christ. Say, Lord, excuse me, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. Uh, and what I wanted to talk to you about, that one too, Lord, soak that one too. And keep on talking. Don't let it interrupt you. The reason it interrupts you is because it's a valuable thing. Otherwise, there would be no interruption. You get ready to do wrong, not much interruption. You get ready to do right, there's something in the cotton picking away every time. I'm going to church today. Argument with your wife, argument with the kids. Somebody did this, the car blew up, the, ran out of gas, flat tire, no money, stomach hurts today of all days, got the flu, got sick, coughing my head off, whatever it might be. Why is there always... Because it's worth something. You get ready to go do something that's wrong. There ain't no opposition. It's 9 o'clock at night, I'm going out to the bar. I'm going to pop a couple of tops and soak some suds here or suck some suds or whatever and have me a time stay out till 3 o'clock in the morning. No interruption. Wide open, man. Get ready to pray, and it is one thing after another. Getting to church hers, interruption, 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 interruption. Somebody interrupts you before you even get it out of the parking lot. You walk into, walk into Walmart or J.C. Penney or whatever you go to, whatever store you walk into, all the interruptions don't bother you at all. You come into church, and an interruption, 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 interruption. And, it, and it's, why do you think that is? Because it's worth something trying to pry you out. But all they're trying to do, and the other thing is, is bring you in. All right, a little bit further in the passage here, notice what he says, sweet incense that is there, uh, every morning. So there's a time for it. 
um, over there in, uh, in Acts chapter number 12. He talks about praying morning and evening. I thought about this one time. Uh, we, were, we were at a, a, a prison one time and I uh, watched a guy over here. It was noontime. We were getting ready to go to the uh, place to uh, eat something. And uh, there's a guy out in the middle of the, of the uh, uh, yard there, is what they call it, but the field in between the mess hall and the, the prison thing. And this guy stops right there. He's like by his watch and stops and I guess finds what East is. And he gets down on the uh, grass there and he starts praying. And I asked the chaplain, I said, what is that? He said, well, that guy's a devout Muslim. And he does that every day, no matter where he's at. He does that every day. I got to thinking about that. That put me under conviction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That guy's praying to a God that don't even exist <laughs> and believes in something that's going to put him in hell, and he's more devout in his prayer life than I am. I pray three times a day over my meals. I wouldn't eat without praying over my meals. Pray for the Lord to sanctify it so it doesn't kill me and go ahead and eat it, right? But <laughs> I got to thinking, man, can you imagine the Lord holding up a Muslim and saying, how come that God prays more than you do? has a better prayer life than you got. And he ain't got nothing to pray about. Bismillah and all that other kind of stuff. Verse number uh, 8. And with uh, Aaron, uh, Aaron lighteth the lamps at evening. See? Morning and evening. And shall burn in ship, uh, uh, incense upon it. A perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generation. First Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm not going to get where I wanted to get here. But you're getting the idea, right? First Thessalonians chapter number 5. Verse 17. You see it? Paul on epistle. You know why? It's not because it's a religious thing. It's not a God is great, God is good, let us thank you for our food and buy his hands, do all our fed. That's a good way to start a kid out, to help them to learn that, but it's not that. It's the, the Bible says that we're to pray without ceasing. Look at uh, Philippians chapter number 4. Philippians chapter number 4. How come when it comes to, uh, to these matters right here, how come it would be that uh, you, you hear all the preaching on haircuts and hemlines? You hear all of this, this don't touch, don't taste, don't handle. You hear all of this you know, ritualistic rule-keeping stuff. How come you don't hear anything about pray without ceasing? I guarantee if you pray without ceasing, the rest of the stuff will take care of itself. You've got somebody that's bothering you in here that don't dress right and don't look right or they are, you know, got earrings or tattoos or whatever it is that trips your trigger for right now in life whatever it is that bothers you or upsets you or whatever it might be, I guarantee if you just learn to pray, you'd be surprised how that stuff just melts away. If you're in constant state of prayer, you're always sitting there burning right over that altar. You're realizing, man, I'm a soup sandwich. I ain't got no business slinging no darts at nobody else. Philippians chapter number 4 uh, should be about verse number 6. That's it. Verse 6, be careful for nothing but in everything. By how? By prayer. And supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. With everything. You're supposed to pray about everything. Romans chapter number 12. Well, stop off in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter number 6. Galatians, Ephesians. Now, I'll give you the types of this this evening. Ephesians chapter number 6. And look, if you will, please, it'll be in verse number 18. 17. Now, if you've got an old Schofield Bible there, he divides the thing about the warrior's armor, and then he comes down there and talks about your resources and all that, but there's no break in your original text there. When I say original, I don't mean Greek, I mean English. And the Bible says praying how often? Always. always. Y'all got a little sheepish there. <laughs> Verse 18, 618. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching whereunto with all perseverance and supplication for who? Everybody that's saved, you're supposed to be praying for them. I don't like them. That ain't what he says. He says you pray for all of them. You'd be surprised, Romans chapter number 12, you'd be surprised how many people uh, that if you pray for them, you'd be surprised uh, how that bitterness can't take root in your life toward that individual. You'd be surprised how all of a sudden that hate and animosity gets melted away. You know why? 
it, it can't take root in soil like that. When the Lord says to you, bless them that persecute you, you know what he's doing? He's not doing it so that you can dump hot coals on their head. He's saying, I'm doing this for your, uh, your protection. It keeps you from getting something in you that's going to hurt you. So you, you, you pray for them. Pray the Lord will bless them. Don't get upset if I do bless them. Don't worry about it. I'll take it, but I'm helping you out. See, we think, well, Lord, if I pray for them, it looks like they're right and I'm wrong. No, you missed it. God's doing that to help you from something taking root in you. Right. I'm going to preach about that today, but you ever had somebody come up to you and say something and you took it one way and then you go around and tell everybody something that they said, I've got to pray for them, 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 pray for them. You tell 50 people, pray for them. I've got to talk to them. I can't believe they said that. And then you go talk to them and you say, Brother, uh, you know, you said so-and-so to me. And, it really, and, and, and he's like, what? That's, what? I didn't say that. If I did, I didn't, I, that's not what I meant. And you don't say, I don't know why you heard it. Like, you know what you say? You say, well, I'm sorry I said that. I, I, I messed that up. Now, you don't go back and tell them other 30 or 40 people you had praying for you that you got it fixed, that you were twisted when you heard it that way. But you, you heard it because you already had a preconceived notion. That thought got in you, and the next thing you know, you just think that you just know they're after you. And ladies, isn't that true? You, you, there's somebody you don't like that's talking to somebody you do like and you just you know what they're talking about because you're the center of the universe. <laughs> you know when you walk by they're talking about you and then you walk by them and they quit talking. It's like, I knew it. I knew it. And then you, you know what happens? You, that stuff gets, you start praying about that, you'll be surprised. It can't find any place to make no roots. It dies off. Amen. It dies off. We got some real weirdos around here. Amen? And you say, well, what, do you, what do you do? You pray and keep the focus on yourself. And remember what people must have thought of you when you first came around. <laughs> You've kind of gotten the luster knocked off of you now, but some of us were... They, they may be weird, man, but we were, we were steamrolling TVs and flying flags and these, these kids nowadays, they think they're doing something because they're on the street corner. They <laughs> Some of the stuff we used to do is pretty far out there. In the name of Jesus. And now you see them thinking, man, they're out there. Just pray. Just pray. Romans chapter 12. We're going to have to stop here. It's just 1030. Romans chapter number 12. Does this help you at all? Yeah. Uh, it's trying to make a practical thing. It, it, it's, uh, it's, it, it's telling you the importance of seeing that in the book of Revelation, but then... Going a little further with it, let's make a practical application of it. You ever, you ever give up on somebody, quit praying for them? Well, why? Eternity's not here yet. There's nothing greater than be praying for somebody for years and years and years and see God come through with that thing at the right time and say, how about that? And you say, I sure am glad I didn't quit praying. Well, that God would have brought them in anyway. Okay, whatever. What, what, but isn't it a blessing that God lets you get in on it and say, now aren't you glad you didn't quit praying? Yes, sir. Romans chapter number 12, verse number 12. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Uh, I was talking to a brother before the uh, service, and he's um, having a, an, an opportunity to minister to some people and talk to some people and things like that in his new position. And I said, well, what do you do, brother? And he said, well, preacher, he says, if I can't do nothing else, I'll tell him, hey, why don't you just step in here and uh, we'll close the door and pray about it. I said, man, that's, a, that's the best thing in the world you could do. Now, he didn't know what I was going to talk to you about in Sunday school, but that's the best thing you can do. You don't have to have an answer for everything. But you'd be surprised at a bond that can be united between you when you just pray with somebody about something. You'd be surprised. Father, bless your word. I pray that you'll... Uh, uh, bless the service to come. Thank you for these folks that are gathered here. and pray that you'll be with us in the service of the music and the giving and all that we say and do, especially the preaching. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. A short break.